Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this digital Middle Eastern FPNA circle. Maximizing value creation with FPNA business partnering. This is what we'll be talking uh, today. Um, I am very happy to let you know that we've got almost 500 people joining us today. Uh, my name is Hans Gobin. I'm the International FPNA Board Ambassador and FPNA Trends Board Ambassador, uh, Ambassador as well. And today I'll be facilitating this meeting for you. So we hope you're going to have a great time with us. Uh, this is just a quick uh, uh, info about previous meetings we've had in this geography in uh, the Middle East. So please take some time and uh, uh, go through it. What do we have on the agenda for you today? So today we will talk about um, FPNA value creation and business partnering model. I'll share with you some stats and what's happening out there. Uh, then we will go and look at the five pillars for FPNA as a value creator, uh, winning value creation and FPNA business partnering model and system. What is that system? How are we using it? Uh, we will then go and look at value creation through sustainability, uh, how technology is an enhancing FPNA business partnering and value creation. Finally, we will do conclusions and recommendation and finish off the session with Q&A uh, at the end. So we've got a, a fully packed agenda uh, and very exciting agenda as well for you today. So let us now meet our um, speakers uh, for today, our panelists. So panelists, if you can join us on the camera and go on um, off mute as well, please. Um, the first person we have there is Mohamed El Ruby, who is CFO Middle East Africa at Pharma Novia. He joins us from Dubai today, and today he will take us through the five pillars for FPNA as a value creator. Uh, Mohamed, great to have you with us today. Thank you, Hans. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our second panelist is Xu Zhang, who is VP Finance at Curriculum Associates. She's based in Boston uh, in the USA, which is where she's joining us from today. And today she will share with us a business partnering and value creation model and system. Uh, Xu, great to have you with us today. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be here. Thank you, Xu. Uh, we move on now to Shady Nassau, uh, who is our third panelist from Middle East, uh, Middle East Finance Director at Bell, based in Dubai also. Uh, and today he will share with us how FPNA is creating value through sustainability. Uh, Shady, great to have you on the panel today. Thank you, Hans. Same for me. Uh, happy to share with you my experience. Thank you, Shady. And finally, we have Andrea Simon, who's Regional Director uh, for MIA at JEDOX, uh, joining us from Dubai as well, um, and will talk to us about how technology can help us to create value. Uh, Andrea, it's great to have you with us again. Thank you very much, Hans. Looking forward to another great session. Fantastic. Thank you very much, panelists. We've got four great panelists, lots of uh, insight and full great presentation coming up for you guys so uh sit still and listen to uh what we've got to share with you today panelists if you can turn your camera off and go on mute i've got a few more um housekeeping slides to go through before we start our presentation for today so um fpna project fpna trends group projects and initiatives you know by now that we are in 27 cities 16 countries and four continents Thankfully, now that we're starting to put COVID behind, we're starting our face-to-face -face meeting. So please be on the lookout. We should be seeing each other face-to-face -face very soon. So what is the digital FPNA board or FPNA circle? So it, it is 90 minutes. Um, your participation is very much anticipated and required. And how you can do that is, of course, We've got four great polling questions, so we would like you to answer them because we want to know what you are doing in your own organization around value creation, but also you will see the insight from the rest of the uh, attendees as well. Q&A sessions, we've got a fantastic Q&A session as usual at the end of uh, the session. You can start to ask questions now via the chat box or wait for the panelists to have presented and then ask a question to that panelist. Make sure you direct it to one panelist, makes it easier. 
Um, we will have 15 or so minutes for Q&A today, but any questions that is not answered today live, we will answer it to you via email. So please send them, send them right till the end of uh, the session as well. We will get them answered to you directly. You can network with us, with the speakers directly via LinkedIn. Uh, remember the handouts that I'm sharing, um, we are going through is down, you can download uh, today. Uh, or you will receive a copy of the recording and presentation within two days or so of the meeting. Finally, when I close the meeting, um, there will be a feedback uh, pop-up form that comes up. So please give us 30 seconds or so. Tell us how we did, anything to improve on, but also tell us what subject you would like to hear from us in the future. Very valuable. So please just stay another 30 seconds at the end. Um, Today, our technology sponsor is Jedox. We all know Jedox. They are a modern enterprise performance management platform. So thank you very much, Jedox, for uh, making this possible today. Now, I wanted to share some stats with you before uh, we start our main session uh, to look at value creation and uh, you know what's happening out there. So I thought I'd share some <clears throat> stats from our survey, FPNA Trends Survey. Um, as to where FPNA is spending their time. So if you look at uh, information generation, validation, data collection, um, and driving action and inside generation. So the value creation piece, which is inside generation and driving action is only 35% of our time being spent there. The rest is in data and information generation. But what do best of class organization do? They are very different. Their time is spent 80% value creation, 20% on data. So we need to strive to get there and be able to do very similar. Another very quick stat on annual planning. How long do we spend doing our budget? You could see there in the pinkish color, 61% of the respondents spend between one and three months. And if you look at three to six months, that's another 30. So 91% are spending more than a month. Isn't our budget already up to date if we're spending such a long time? Is this really creating value? There's another stat there for you to look in your own time and it's all about technology. Now, finally, another stat I'd like to share with you is how long does it take to generate a forecast? 4% said less than a day, 13% one to two days. 25% three to four days. If we're spending three to four days doing our, um, our forecast, then if we're doing a monthly forecast, that's three to four days, that's a week every month we're spending doing forecast. Is that value creation? Is that the right sort of thing that we should be doing? And of course, I haven't spoken about the rest here. You know, 12% takes 30 days to do a forecast. So think about that. Uh, this slide is about um, attributes of business partner. Take your time and have a look through it. We've shared this before. And final slide for me here is about the FPNA maturity model around value creation and business partnering. When you look at it, look at what people are doing and organizations are doing in that leading state. Uh, because of time, I don't have um, much time to spend going through this. But what I would like to do now is to start to introduce to you our first speaker, which is Mohamed El Ruby, CFO Middle East Africa at Pharmanovia, and he will take you through the five pillars of value creation or creator. Uh, Mohamed, over to yourself. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we have a very interesting topic about value creation. I believe FPNDA is not just a support functions or a service function. I believe FPNDA is a function that should be in the heart of the organization and a function that can really create value. So let me share with you what kind of value we can create to our organizations. There are two types of value creation. We can help our business partners and we can create value to our customers and our shareholders. The first way is called direct way, which is analyzing the value chain of the finance function itself. So we are as an FP&A, we can sit with our uh, finance colleagues 
challenging and understanding the value creation in the finance, finding opportunities to save, for example, in working capital, improve working capital, in, improve inventory level collections, improve uh, or achieve tax saving. So all of those activities within the finance functions can create a direct value to our shareholders. The second way, which is called indirect way, which is our role to analyze the whole company's value chain, the whole value chain for our organization. And we work like a catalyst inside our organization, parting with all functions, parting with supply chain, parting with commercial, parting with all the other functions in order to help them to create value to our customers and definitely will create value to our shareholders. So we have two ways. We have a lot of opportunities to create value to our organization, either through the direct or the indirect way. Today, I'm going to show you the five enablers or the five key pillars to create values. Let's start with the first one, which is the most important one, which is mindset. We cannot create value. We cannot add value to our organization without changing our mindset. Also, if you are a head of finance or if you have to hire a new team, you have to ensure having the right mindset in your team. What are the key mindsets we need to have in order to create value? Number one, curiosity. We are as a finance, we have to have the curiosity to build relationships with our business partners. We have the curiosity to understand what is behind numbers. So curiosity is very important mindset we should have. Also, our role is not just like a consultant. I, I see some FBA just send recommendations or telling the company, we have to increase price, we have to close the gap, we have to do that and that. This is not our role as a consultant. Our role is to really be a problem solver. We have to be biased for actions and be biased to complete the actions from end to end. This is our role as a finance business partners or FBA business partners. So we need to change the mindset from being just sending recommendation or consulting it is in to really help the organization to solve the business problems. Also from process to relationships, we cannot influence our business partners without having a real and strong relationships with them. We should change our mindset from focusing on process and procedures and system to build relationships with our business partners in order to inf influence them to create value. Also, from complexity to simplicity, I can see many finance people are talented in complicated things. Sometimes they are presenting very complicated tables, very complicated charts. This is not helpful in to create value. So we need to simplify our message. We need to simplify our presentations. We need to simplify through data visualization, through presenting a very simple data story in order to transfer the right message to our business partners. Also from challenging to coaching, our role is to coach the organization, asking the right questions, not to tell the organization what they have to do. Our role is to ask the right questions. And once we ask the right questions, we can get the right business insights. Also from email to face-to-face, -face, our role is not to sit behind computer screens, preparing reports and budgeting and forecasting. Our role is to meet our business partners, meet our commercial team, to ask them the right questions and help them to solve their business problems. After having the right mindset, the second pillar is to have the right skill set. Skill set, as mentioned by Hans and the FPND boards, there are a very important skill set we have to build for our FPND to create value. Number one, again, building relationships. We cannot influence people. We cannot challenge people without building a proper business relationships with them. Business acumen. This is our admission ticket to all decision-making tables. We cannot ask the right questions. We cannot provide business insights. We cannot understand the value chain to create value without having a proper and solid business acumen. Turning data into insights, our role is not to just, you know, present numbers or recommendations or actu comparing actual versus plan or versus budget. Our role is to provide a true actionable insights to our business partners which is answering the question of what happened, why that happened, and so what? How can we improve our business? How can we close the gap? How can we mitigate the risk? Which is the true actionable insights. Data storytelling. We are not just presenting numbers. We are not just, you know, presenting financial statements. We have to learn how to 
tell a true, a true data storytelling and the true business stories in order to inspire our organizations for actions. Problem solving, again, we are not just a consultant. We have to solve the problems. And last but not least, technology, which is our big help to improve our process, to get the proper data from systems, to provide predictive and pres prescriptive analytics. So technology is very important and big help for us to create value. Moving to the third pillar, which is system technology. If we have the right mindset, we have the right skill set, we need a tool to help us to provide business insights. We need tools and systems to analyze our data, to provide our organization the true business insights and foresights. So when you implement any system, number one, it should be aligned with the business needs. I saw many finance professionals implemented systems, but which, which, which was not aligned with the business need, which was not aligned with their stakeholders. So we have to ensure our system is aligned with our stakeholders' needs, with our business partners' needs. Number two, it should be a system user-friendly. This is, will help us to free up our time. It will help us to provide a real-time business reports and also to help our business partners to navigate in the system and having an easy user-friendly system. Quality of data, this is our source of building credibility. Without having a quality of data, we cannot build the credibility with our business partners. So we need a, a trusted system which is providing us a quality of data. Also, we need system to support visualization. As I mentioned, we have to simplify our message to our business partners. We need to simplify our presentation. So we need a system to support data visualization and storytelling. And last but not least, we have to ensure system helping us in predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, which is the looking forward mindset we should have leveraging our system and our technology. The fourth pillar, which is capacity. If you have the right team, right system, right skill set, right mindset, but if your team doesn't have time, how can they create value? So you are as a leader, you have to ensure freeing up your team's time and focusing their time only on the high value adding activities. So I name it the four eights, eliminate, automate, delegate, and reallocate. Eliminate all the unnecessary tasks. I see finance people sometimes on monthly, on monthly basis, they prepare a big deck for 50 slides, 70 slides, and at the end management only focusing on the first three or five slides. So why wasting our time in another 40 or 50 slides? So eliminate all the unnecessary tasks. Automation, which is a big help to free up our time. Automate as much as you can from your process to free up your team's time. Delegate, let's delegate the low value adding activities. Let's delegate the less value adding activities tasks to third parties or to other, other function to free up our team's time. And the last one, reallocate. Sit with your business leaders, sit with your top management, understand from them what are the key strategic drivers in, in your organization, what are the st key strategic factors in your organization, and reallocate your time and your team's time only on the key success factor, on the key strategic priorities for your organization. The last pillar, which is about culture, we shouldn't forget culture. Yes, we should have the right system, having the right team, the right mindset, the right, and free up our uh, team's time, but we shouldn't forget culture. We should have a culture of agility, as you see that everything is changing very fast around us. So we need to uh, provide our business partners a fast reports, a fast insights. So we need to work in a very high agility. Number two, transparency, to build Trust with your business partners to build credibility inside your organization, to build the credibility and the trust within the team. We should have transparency, we should have trust and collaboration. I believe FP&A should work in the heart of the organizations. So we have to collaborate with all functions. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't say no to any cross-functional projects. This will help us to build relationships with people, understand our business very well, and to create value to our organization. Last but not least, diversity. Ensure diversity in your team. 
someone is strong in systems, someone is strong in data storytelling, someone is strong in building relationships, ensure diversity in your team, and I'm sure those five pillars will help you to create value to your organization. Thank you very much, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Great presentation. You know, of course, it's some sit up here, but what you started with and what you ended up with for me are those two key things. It's the mindset, creating that mindset within the team, but also culture coming from the top, uh, you know, it makes it so, so important. So thank you for sharing uh, this model. Very, very uh, uh, intuitive and, and very important indeed. Uh, now that uh, uh, you've taken us through, let us hear from our um, uh, members that have joined us today about, you know, which of these five pillars for value creation is a priority for their own organization. So ladies and gentlemen, if you can vote, please. So which of these five pillars that Mohammed has just taken you through uh, for value creation is a priority for your organization? M creating the right mindset, having the right sort of skill set, um, having the right systems and tools. Uh, the fourth one, ensuring the team have enough capacity at all time. And finally, having the right culture. If you can vote, please. So option one, the right mindset. Option two, the right skill set. Option three, the right systems and tool. Uh, option four, ensuring the team have enough capacity. And finally, having the right culture within the team. I'll give it another five uh, seconds or so. If you can vote, please, that will be um, excellent. So tell us which of these five pillars for value creation is a priority in your organization. So I'm now going to uh, uh, close the poll and I will share um, the answer. So as we can see there, 44% said it's about the right mindset. 9% skill set, 22% system and tool, 9% again about capacity and 16% around culture. Uh, so uh, a quick insight from you then, Mohammed, on the outcome, please. Yeah, actually, I'm very happy from seeing that people uh, seeing 44% is focusing on mindset, which is uh, right, you know, uh, focus. And we cannot start any process. We cannot implement system. We cannot implement and create value. We cannot do anything without having the, the right mindset. So I'm very happy that this is the highest percentage came from mindset. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much there, uh, Mohammed. And uh, uh, let, let us now go and look at uh, a question that you would like to ask the other panelists. Uh, panelists, if you can join me, please. All of you, including yourself as well, um, Mohammed. So which one of these pillars have you as finance leader been promoting and working on in your own organization? So um, if I can come to you, Shu, for a, a, a quick answer, please. Yeah, well, I think it's very um, it's very hard for me to choose because these are very very important for any FNA you know organization to be successful, right? But I would say you know I have been focusing on a lot uh, the past few years on the culture because I'm a strong believer of the right team, right culture. It's not about you know the team, which is FNA team. It's more about the company team, right? The co company see our FNA team and how the company culture, right, supporting this kind of activity. So I also am a very strong believer that, you know, once we have happy employees, we also have, you know, a lot of things going on. For example, they can be more productive, they're very open to change, and they are very collaborative, and these are all the things impact a lot of other stuff. So that's why, you know, I have been promoting a very strong, you know, right team, right culture standpoint. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Shady, your answer, please. Well, I tend to agree, but I'm uh, my heart is closer to the 9% uh, who answered capacity. You know, these days with the inflation and with the cost pressure, we've been focusing a lot on capacity. Uh, we're, we're working on reallocating tasks and continuously looking for further efficiencies. Although this might not be the, the right long-term goal, unless it's that drastically disrupted by a technological change, or enhancement. However, this this has to come and make sure that it does not come at the expense of the team's well-being and development. So it is linked to the mindset, but it's more on the capacity these days uh, from from what we're experiencing. Absolutely, Shady. Thank you very much for that insight. And finally, Andreas. Hi. Uh, yes, uh, I, uh, all the pillars are, of course, very important. 
Uh, we as a technology provider will have worked very hard in the last half year internally uh, under the topic uh, eat your own dog food, I would say, to make sure that uh, we have um, all the technology in place that we don't have to produce these 40 and 50 slide, slides uh, monthly deck anymore, that everything is coming out of the system can be presented directly there. So that is one of the things which we did in the last half year very strongly. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Absolutely great point from all three and four of you, uh, including Mohammed. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. Let us now um, go off our camera and start to introduce our next uh, presenter, who is uh, Xu Zhang and uh, VP Finance at Curriculum Associates. And today she will take us through uh, the model uh, and the system, as she called it, for value creation and business partnering. Uh, over to you, Xu, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Very, very happy to be here. Um, so today is basically I will talk about um, the how we win the value creation and how we set up a, a model or a management system within the organization to achieve the value creation. So um, before I go too far away, um, I would like to spend very short time to briefly introduce the company I work for because it's a U.S. domestic company. Um, so you probably never heard about that. So it's one of the, um, the largest private education tech company in U.S. serving the K-12 to students. Uh, it's a private company owned by a few global private equity firms. And, um, and why I mentioned my company is because, you know, today's value creation model, which I will talk later, has been applied to my company and very well received um, by the executive team and also the board of directors. And this is only not the first time I implement this model as well. Um, I also had successful stories implementing this model to other two companies um, that I have, you know, I share, um, that I worked for in the past 10 years. So I'm very happy to share um, my experience and learning with all of you today. All right, uh, so the next slide, uh, we're going to discuss what is the value creation model and uh, what is the management system. So first of all, um, it is not a software for sure and um, it is not a science project. So what is it? Um, so let's step back thinking about for one minute and talk about FPNA. So what is FPNA, right? The scope and the bar for expertise in FPNA continues to rise the past few years. As you know, company scale, you know, we launched a new product um, and new business models and channels. Um, so in my humble opinion, so FPNA is not only a traditional function anymore, like provide insights, analyzing the data. Um, it is more about like partnership, right? And the partnership is more like partner with the business to manage the business together. So, um, and how we manage business that includes manage the strategy, manage data and manage the direction. So with that in mind, with that in mind um, so this management system is born here. So the management system is a business ecosystem. It is a strategic plan and um, a strategy deployment system based on three clarity components. The clarity of objectives, the clarity of role and responsibilities and clarity of alignment. And um, clarity of objectives means whether we know what we're doing, right? And why we check certain metrics. Are these metrics the most critical and relevant to ultimate goal? Um, the clarity of role and responsibility means whether we know who is doing what and how we achieve our objectives. Believe it or not, the clear role and responsibility sounds very simple, but lots of team companies have the problem that role and responsibilities are not super clear especially when the companies has been experiencing rapid growth and expansion the past few years. So the last one, clarity alignment, is do we know how teams are connected and work together to achieve the ultimate objectives? Are we aligned on the steps to get there? So in conclusion, this management system is to provide three clarities as the foundation of managing business. So in the following slide, um, I will discuss the fundamentals of these objectives. So number one is lean principles, right? So what is lean? That means focus, simple, and get to the point. So four categories here, right? We have a customer-centric value measurement. We have a standardization here where possible. So we don't want to create a customized a lot of all over the place, right? And we, always, we also want to minimize the reliance on disparate source system because the data is a consolidated data. It gets from various of system, so, and we don't want to say, okay, because the system is not available, so we couldn't produce any type of data. So the lean principles is very important as the number one priority here. And number two is the single version of truth. 
and how we can keep all the information in one shared platform where people have access to and reveal the data and information in a consistent way. Number three is manage the unexpected. How we can have minimized meaningless data, right? How we never meet to inform and we only meet to correct or advantage exceptional results, right? If the goals are achieved or failed, right? We never conditionally achieved. It's, it's black and white, right? And then if it is not achieved, how we're gonna resolve that problem. So you see how many problems, how many times that I mentioned simple and focused. And these are two of the foundations for successfully rolling out the system. So what are the benefits and why we're doing this? So I will address this in the following slides. So three things, focus, I mentioned many times, alignment and response. So what is the focus piece? The focus piece is basically a clear connection between a strategy planning and a strategy deployment. So for example, like we set up the plans, but how are we gonna execute it, right? Do we have enough measurement to against our true north? The true north is at our final objective. Are these measurement alignment, right? And then are these measurements that tie to our final true north? Are we have a common business language through the standards measurement and KPIs? Do the KPIs in this company mean the same thing, right? Do we have, co for example, we call gross margin. Are we meaning the same thing across the board? So this is so important that we have a single, simple, and focused measurement. Number two is alignment. A clear definition of success and single version of truth. Make sure that all the parties understand the accountable and dependency relationship. We are transparent about our objective and we are also transparent on how we can get there and who needs to depend on what and how we work together to get there. Number three is responsive. So we are basically based on decision making. We want to avoid any analysis to support the results. We want to make sure that we have role and responsibilities. So in case that something goes wrong, we can always find the ownership and the accountability. Now let's move on to what are included in this management system and execution component. So I will address the following slide, the first component that you need a scorecard. A scorecard, a lot of companies call it in different ways. Some companies call it a checking sheet, some companies call it a scorecard or a KPI card. Um, but a scorecard with the, it's basically a KPI spreadsheet, right? With the most important and relevant metric to achieve your objective. So a few points here. Every function should have a scorecard. So finance should have one, you know, sales have one, marketing have one, you know, um, you know, you name it. And company-wide also should have one consolidated one. And the number of KPIs are important as well, that you don't want to have too many and lose the focus, which is I mentioned several times here. So usually we recommend no more than 10 for each function. So this way that you can have a focus. And number three is what kind of KPIs are also important here, right? Because the KPIs should be aligned across the functions to ensure the collaboration and dependency. So I ask you to thinking about it, all your KPIs that you have today, which ones are really, really important and relevant to our objectives, whether you could bucket them into the four buckets I have here for standardization. The buckets include your financials, your customer related, for example, NPS score, your employees, for example, like how many hiring, what is their NPS score or satisfaction rate right, for employees and operational process. So for example, like do I get efficiency enough, right? For certain of the process. So once you have identified all your KPIs and aligned and ready to execute, so what will happen? And this is the part that I see a lot of companies have been, you know, failed because I want to, and I want to bring it up to your attention. So the most important part is not like reporting your KPIs and, but the actions you are take to manage your KPIs. So with that being said, I would like to introduce the second component of the management system. So this is called um, problem solving sheet. Um, it can be any format that you can design within your organization, right? And what is included in the sheet is super important. So the sheet provides a simple and strict documented approach for problem solving. So documented actions that we take from each relevant party to ensure execution. So what are included? So you can see on the left side, um, there is a root cause of the problem, what lesson we learned so far, what can we do differently, and what we want to resolve, what we want to achieve, and what is the measurement of success? Who is doing what to execute? 
what's the timeline, what are the role and responsibilities, and how we do the follow up and implement. So these are about 10 steps that I summarize on the right side for you are very critical to manage the system and also the foundation on KPI success in your organization. I wanna say one more time, reporting KPIs is really not a goal, it's managing the KPIs is the goal. So in conclusions, management has two components, scorecard and managing scorecard with documented sheet. Now, when and how we do all of this and how to embed the system to our monthly routine. And here's a monthly calendar I'm sure you're all familiar with, right? It shows a very structured, a standardized structure, you know, for every month that how you do month and close, how you do partnerships. So you can see the first five days is a close. It is the interactive process between accounting and finance that because we were responsible for month and close assurance, right? And number second, we publish our KPI scorecard to see where we are and then analyze, provide insights and the most important part, which is in the second, in the third week of the month, is to work with the business to focus on the problem solving sheet. So once we finish the whole process, we roll up our findings and have our corporate meeting review and discuss. Again, we meet to solve the problem, not to inform where we are. So I hope everyone enjoyed the session today and you could try to implement it in your organization. So, and I'm open to answer any questions if you run any into your issues. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shu. Fantastic presentation. You know, um, I really like the problem solving sheet. The, the whole idea is about, you know, you can design this fantastic system to, to manage value creation. But what happens if you don't monitoring? As you said, it's not about reporting KPIs, just making sure they're working. And then what if it's not working? What are we going to do about it? So uh, fantastic there. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let us look at, uh, you know, now um, what our audiences are doing in terms of value creation management system uh, as to what you call it. So please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can vote, can you tell us, do you have a value creation management system within your organization? Uh, yes, we do. It works very, very well. Not in specific is the second option, but value creation is very big on the agenda. You still work through it. Yeah. And then finally, no, we do not. Value creation is not on our agenda at all. If you can vote, please. And the first, the question is, do you have a value creation management system within your organization? Is it defined? Yes, we do. It works very well. Not in specific, but value creation is very much on the agenda. We work through it. And then finally, no, we do not. And value creation is not on the agenda uh, majorly. I am now going to close the poll. Thank you for voting and I'm gonna share this information with Shu and you guys. So 13% said, yes, we've got a great model. It works very well. 63% said, uh, not a specific model as per se, but value creation is very much on the agenda. And finally, 23% says value creation is not on the agenda at all. Shu, what can you tell us about what we're seeing here? Wow, you know, um, I'm not super surprised about 86%, right? The company, either they don't have today or they don't have a structure, you know, process. So um, I, I, I hope that you found the session today is very helpful and you can try to implement your organization. And um, I guarantee I implement in three companies, it all work very well. So, um, so I'm actually, I'm very excited that how you're going to utilize the model that I introduced to implement your organization and see how it works. Fantastic, Shu. Great, great point there. Of course, 13% do, 63% are somewhat doing something, but I think it's just making sure, you know, there's a specific model and you're working towards it, you're monitoring it is the key thing. So let us now hide this and move on to our question um, to the other panelists, which comes from Shu again here. Uh, panelists, join me, please, uh, if you may. So how does value creation work within your own organization? Do you have a specific system or model or how do you do it? Uh, if we go uh, to uh, Shady, first of all, Shady. Thanks, Hans, and thank you, Shu, for the, for the great presentation. Look, we, we currently have, we have a model and our financial model is integrated as part of the S&OP model that is based on the multifunctional feedback uh, on, on clear dates and gates within within the month. The, the funny part is that there is no, it does not account for any vacations during the month. But the joke aside, it is the backbone structure that that incorporates the several aspects and factors impacting our daily business. 
uh, at the same time the model uh, includes which which i believe is a very important part is it includes a forward looking beyond even a two-year horizon sometimes that we sometimes tend to forget the the, the long-term picture when when we're uh, focusing on these things thank you very much shady uh mohammed your answer please yeah, thank you, Shu, for the great presentation. I like the model very much. Uh, in our organization, yes, we have uh, uh, a, a same model. And also, we linked it to the, our employees' objectives. As you mentioned, Shu, it's, uh, the implementation or the execution of the strategy is very important. This is why in our organization, for each employee, when they put their uh, annual KPIs or their annual objectives, each one they have to link it to the strategy so this kpi is related to which strategy so this is to ensure everyone is linked to the organization's uh, strategy and all the functions are working on the same uh, objectives absolutely we've got to all be pulling uh, along the same sort of line thank you for that andreas finally your answer please no, we have the same situation that uh, all the objectives of the people are linked to the strategy and uh, will be monitored quite closely um, but that is um, everything what we're doing in terms of this value creation model. I think we can do a little bit more. Absolutely. There's always uh, much more we can do, and, and it's all about learning from each other and other organizations. So thank you very much, uh, panelists. Uh, let, we will now shortly move on to our next pillar. But, but just let me remind the audience, please, can, if you can send your questions, please do so via the chat box. We will answer some of them live today. The rest that we can't answer, we will answer to you um, via email. So uh, if we now turn our webcam off and go on to the next session, and the next session is from uh, Shady, who is Middle East Finance Director at Bell. And today, Shady will talk about value creation through sustainability. Uh, Shady, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. And uh, good morning to good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you today, and uh, I'm going to take a slightly different route than my fellow panelists. And today I'm going to talk to you about the only value creating KPI that really matters, which is making our planet a better place for, for us and our children. Moving on, moving on, we, it is important to ensure the balance between responsibility and profitability. Responsibility is where we are steering our decision makings towards a positive impact on our people and planet. And definitely, all this has to happen while maintaining healthy financials in parallel, because only a profitable business is capable of investing a sustainable growth that provides the, the fuel for this growth engine. Moving on, it's important to highlight that to create value through sustainability, we have identified five key challenges. It covers the whole value chain. From providing healthier food through sustainable agricultural, packaged and responsible material, to fighting climate change by opting for renewable energies for all our factories. All this while delivering accessible and affordable products for everyone. And the next on the next slide, I'll show you that in our fight against climate change, we have identified a set of targets to be achieved by 2025. Our targets are science-based and in line with the COP21 in Paris 2015. We commit to carbon neutral operations, and we also commit to reduce our carbon footprint from farm to fork, which is a representation of our complete value chain. With deforestation, posing as a main threat to climate change. We also commit to achieve zero deforestation in our supply chain and packaging. In our production facilities, we are committed to renewable energy and reduction of water usage. Finally, we commit to have our partners full, full animal feed from traceable and sustainable supply chain. Because we are true to our commitment, and we care more about our planet than greenwashing, we also want to ensure that our partners are as equally committed as we are on this important topic. In the next slide, we have put 
a framework for achieving our targets. And this framework is based on four main levers. Lever one is targeting the operations where we plan to accomplish complete carbon neutrality from farm to fork. This lever focuses on sustainability in our production facilities and logistics. The second lever focuses on our partners. We don't own farms. This means that our total production is relying on a milk collection. Accordingly, our partners across the value chain play an important role and are responsible to 70% of the total carbon footprint. This lever is important and proves our true commitment rather than the greenwashing stunt. The third lever, however, touches base with our portfolio. In this segment, we make sure we provide our consumers with the right choice in both sustainable raw and packed material. Finally, the, first the fourth lever focuses on the strategy across the whole value chain, and more importantly, the tracking tools used to ensure how we measure accurately our impact. To move on to the first lever, it is, it is important to highlight in this operations lever that we are committed to having all our factories carbon neutral by 2025. The good news, however, is that today we already boast 69% of our total electricities, the electricity in our facilities is used from renewable energy, mainly solar and wind. An important piece of our operations, logistics. We have kicked off globally several efforts to identify efficient transportation options. For example, we have stopped air freighting our products as a medium that we use very frequently these days. Moving on to the second lever, which the second lever targets our partners. And since several years back, our company has committed to pay, to pay a premium to the farmers in return of sustainable KPIs. The premium we provide will help them and provide them with financial freedom and comfort to set up sustainable and regenerative farming practices from energy sources to feed quality and criteria. On the other hand, we are keen on sharing our in-home technological advancements and insights with our partners in efforts to deliver efficiency and sustainability. On the third pillar, I tackle our portfolio. And it's important also for us to have a balanced portfolio to achieve our sustainability targets. Last year, we have accelerated our plant-based and hybrid cheese development, and we are working to have it represent 50% of our portfolio in the coming years. Why? Because plant-based cheese has 55% lower carbon footprint than dairy cheese. So this is when it comes to raw material. When it comes that represents 60% of our cost. But when it comes to packed material, we are opting for paper and cardboard to replace our plastic. So far, 70% of the packaging is paper or cardboard, and 92% are recyclable or biodegradable. However, for the fourth uh, pillar, in the first pillar, this is where we track several factors by business unit. We're still develop developing several tools. However, currently we can measure CO2 emissions by unit, the weight of positive products in our portfolio. We also track agricultural regeneration and feed quality and sustainability. And we measure accessibility and partner engagement through several development KPIs. Finally, it's only natural for sustainability to be the responsibility of finance. As guardians of the temple, finance has great expertise in managing resources efficiently. Another resource to manage are those of our planet. With more and more companies dubbing their CFOs are as chief impact officers or chief value officers. What role can finance play in sustainability, one might ask. To bring it closer to FB&A, finance role covers the full spectrum. It starts by having sustainability as top of mind and factoring in economic, social, and governmental factors in all our projects, simulations, and assessments. 
The second most important action is forecast accuracy. By improving forecast accuracy, we are streaming our inventories, operations, logistics, and more importantly, reducing waste. Driving the portfolio mix can also play a pivotal role in reducing carbon footprint, as explained earlier in the difference between plant-based and dairy-based cheese. Definitely managing the supply chain is very important. That's why, for example, we decided to eliminate the full reliance on air freight, and we tried to find sustainable alternatives. <coughs> Finally, we also work a lot with our distributors and encourage them to use renewable energy, especially those who have wide space in their warehouses. We encourage them to use their warehouse rooftops for the solar panels, and also we encourage them to utilize vans with low or zero emissions. Finally, I hope sustainability is high on your and your company's priorities. It's an important KPI, as I mentioned earlier, to leave you with. Thank you. Shady, thank you very much. What a, a great presentation and a completely different um, aspect of value creation um, from your perspective and the great step and great advances your company has taken towards sustainability and leaving us with this last page as to how important FPNA is in terms of leading and bringing all of this together. And we just saw from uh, Shu's presentation, it's about the monitoring, it's about bringing the numbers together, et cetera, so that we as an organization can push this agenda forward. So absolutely great, thank you for doing that. Um, let us see what our audiences and our FPNA board members are doing in terms of sustainability in their own organization. So if you can vote, please, how far up the priori prioritization list or ladder is your organization on sustainability? Is it a high priority with finance playing a big role in it? It is a high priority. However, finance doesn't play much of a role in it. Uh, third one is low priority or the fourth one, not at all on the agenda. If you can vote, please. How far up the prioritization list in your organization is the sustainability agenda? High priority and finance playing a big role. High priority with finance playing no role. Low priority and then finally not on the agenda at all. If you can vote, please, I'll give it another uh, five seconds. And I'm now going to close the vote and share it with you. So, um, so we can see 33% high priority with finance playing a big role, 26% high priority, but no role played by finance, 33% low priority, 9% not on the agenda at all. Uh, Shady, a quick uh, um, insight from you on the poll, please. I'm very happy, Hans, to see the 33% on the high priority and happy to see that finance is playing the big role. As mentioned, uh, I'm expecting soon to, to have all the CFOs changing titles into chief value officers or chief impact officers. And this, this shows a lot about the role that finance has to play in the future of sustainability and again, the future of our planet. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Shady. Let us hide that and let us move to our a question from Shady to the other panelists. So panelists, please join us. And the question here is how important is sustainability within your own organization and what role does finance play in it? Uh, Mohammed, a quick answer from yourself, please. Yeah, thank you, Shady, for the great presentation. Give us another uh, great uh, perspective. Uh, in our organization, yes, it's very important, our organization, and it's part also of the KPIs for all employees, not only for finance, it's across all employees. And it's, it's actually it's led by another function because it's part of our legal and compliance functions. You are taking care of it. So it's a whole organization uh, target, not only finance. Fantastic. Thank you. Shu, your answer, please. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, the sustainability is more about long term, right? That we don't sacrifice, you know, the long term benefits, but doing some short term profitability stuff. So I will say, you know, I don't think the the shift to a business really, you know, um, for example, business model that invests sustainability really fundamentally changed the role of finance functions. But I think it really um, extends the scope of the focus and support 
um, that finance can provide. So for example, like whether we need to source some of the funds, right, for green initiatives, or we need to evaluate some of the business cases that include the non-financial value by reporting or reporting some, you know, like sustainable performance metrics. I would say, you know, um, it's very important and every company should thinking about sustainability and also the long-term versus looking at only short-term like investors uh, stuff. So that's, that's my point of view. Thank you very much for that. And finally, Andres? Uh, for us, very important because a lot of our employees are asking also for that. Uh, we are a very young organization and the younger the people get, the more they are looking for a sustainable environment. Uh, and that is one thing which is very important on our agenda. And it's driven by finance because finance is not only officially um, the finance function uh, within JEDOX, but also responsible for HR. And HR is driving these kind of uh, initiatives as well. And I would like to add to that, the guardian of the temple is the few words that Shady used as well. So fantastic answers, uh, everyone, and Shady, great presentation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, panelists. Let us now move on to our next presentation, which will be, of course, on technology. So if we can turn our webcam all off and uh, let uh, Andreas take uh, away this session. So, of course, Andreas will be talking to us about uh, technology uh, and uh, how important it is in value creation. Andreas, over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, yeah, so my topic is again technology and how it can enhance FPA business partnering. So when we are looking at the management of our companies or the management of the companies, nothing has so much changed over the last decades and years. So we still are producing strategic plans and deriving financial plans from it. Um, creating operational plans, uh, running the operation, reporting on it, doing analytics, simulation, performance, and optimization. So that wheel is still the same, uh, like always. The only thing what has changed, it's spinning faster and faster. Uh, that's perhaps uh, because we had pandemics, we have unfortunately a war in Europe, we have a lot of other stuff uh, which is going on and which is requiring very fast action. Uh, <clears throat> when we look in our um, global environment and our business environment. Um, in the past, uh, FPNA had a very strong focus on financial planning and financial data today departments along the value chain are uh, need to be included. And uh, that is about finance, not only finance, it's about sales, supply chain, HR, IT. So cross departmental, cross uh, uh, along the whole value chain, it's important to include these um, departments to make sure that you know what's going on and if something is happening in some of these departments it's automatically show up in your uh, future balance sheet or your future PL. When we on my next slide uh, I see what is the big issue uh, when we are looking at our FPNA and when we want to make sure that everything is collaborating and automated and etc is that still 80% of organizations are still are relying on Excel at the foundation of the budgeting planning and forecasting. Uh, when I started uh, 28 years ago in the area of enterprise performance management, it was more than 90%. So we came a little, now 28 years later, we have now, uh, we are down by 10%. That's not a lot, I must say. So I think it could be definitely better. So it's still 80% of all the companies are using Excel. Uh, and also when you look at the next slide, <coughs> we have a, uh, even uh, more worrying data, it's about there's still 88% of business are using 100 customized spreadsheets to support the business, but one third of the respondent of a Forrester research said that they are using more than 10,000 spreadsheets in their organization. Unbelievable, what a kind of manual effort uh, with all these disconnected spreadsheets with the problems you have uh, in, in that process. One of the examples uh, how uh, technology can help uh, when we're automating our budgeting planning process, you see on the next slide where um, you see what is happening when you're completely relying on Excel. So the typical Excel planning process is you load initial data in your Excel sheet, you distribute the sheets via email, uh, normally uh, one email for each spreadsheet. We have customers with more than 300 departments. Uh, imagine you need to send out 300 e emails with 300 Excel sheets. Then all the people start entering the data and when they start entering the data, they are getting very creative. They are changing 
columns, uh, things in the Excel sheet, etc. Collecting the data is difficult because you don't know when they started, you don't know when they're when they're finishing. The uh, monitor because monitor the progress is not possible. There is no workflow uh, available. Then you have to validate the submission of them because if they have changed the Excel sheet, it might be very difficult to consolidate the results, which is also a manual task and therefore very error prone. So very very much in a manual uh, interaction and we saw that <clears throat> when we have looked at the point that forecast taking three to four days I tell you I'm talking with customers where the forecast needs six weeks uh, to um, to collect all the data and uh, manual from the different departments and to create the forecast six weeks imagine that then of course you analyze adjust the scenarios and finalize and track at the end with an enterprise performance management system in place, normally you create a planning model, a model you have already an automated data integration, so all the data are integrated, which you want to use for your budgeting, planning, forecasting, but automatically the data uh, will be taken out of the source system, transactional systems, and will be placed, cleaned, uh, and will be put into uh, to your budgeting planning system. Uh, email notification goes out with an HTTPS link. Online completion is standard. You can monitor the progress because you have a workflow, inbuilt workflow management system, and you can do all your online scenarios that you're reporting as well. So from it, it, it massively reducing the time which you need to <clears throat> collect and and date the data and, and cleans it and uh, put it into the system. On our next slide, <coughs> we see that it's not only automation and integration, it's also about collaboration. So when we talk about, like we said before, we want to go into the area of extended planning and analytics, what Gartner is proposing, where we are including all the different departments along the value chain. Why? Because it's in order, the, the kind of wisdom of the crowd to retain accuracy, make predictions, every member of the group must be given an equal voice. So. The more people you involve, the more people you involve in your budgeting planning process, the better the results are because you immediately get an idea about what's happening in your organization. So XPNA, extend your planning analytics over the Office of Finance into the different departments is very important. On the next slide, we see then also what traditional FPNA has happened and what the new XPNA should do. Uh, in the past, we had these annual planning, quarterly forecasting. In the future, not the six weeks for forecasting anymore, but continuous real-time planning and forecasting supported by the uh, technology because the technology is now an auto mode in terms of uh, data collection, cleansing, and uh, analytics. You have the high-level financial plans, which are now coming to granular operation models and solution because more and more data need to be uh, analyzed. Yeah, there's uh, an incremental, um, uh, incremental increase of uh, data available in different data silos, all that need to be analyzed, uh, where technology can help a lot, data silos and disparate systems, you want to have everything into one platform connected to each other, so when everything was happening in HR and sales, you already see it immediately in real time in your financial system, so instead of top down, bottom up in the past, you want to have driver based simulations uh, augmented with predictive forecasting and machine learning. So at the end, and that is shown on our next slide, we want to move to a, homeworks, a holistic performance management where we are going away from departmental data silos and disparate systems to an integrated planning and performance management system. What that is then leading to is uh, what you can see on the next slide and Hans already talked about it in the intro to our sessions here, is that time spent should not be any more 70% on analyzed data and reporting because that can be done by the machine very easily. It should be 70% on impact, influence, insight. Make sure we are creating high value in terms of moving um, the, the, the work away from the data collection and, and the data cleansing to getting the insights, getting uh, the ideas about how that is impacting the organization and, and steering the, the organization, that is the most important thing. You want to have data analysts, you don't want to have people who are keying in data all the time. <clears throat> and on the next slide, we see 
that the uh, enterprise performance management is supporting your whole journey in digitalization, so the tech technology. It's also about that it's not only what we saw about automation uh, of the planning, budgeting, plan, uh, forecasting, process, and integration. It's also very, very, very important about the collaboration into the different departments, about business partnering, make sure you can be the advisor to the organization, not only in the Office of Finance, but also in the other departments across the value chain. And then, of course, if you are then going to the highest level of maturity with the augmentation and using AI and machine learning, you can increase agility and resilience of your organization because you free up valuable time to make better informed decisions. And that is what I need. What I tell is high value creation from technology. Thank you very much. Andreas, thank you very much for a, a fantastic presentation. Of course, you've spoken about the benefit of technology there, but I think shockingly, 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 you know, 88% using Excel, of which a third uses more than 10,000 spreadsheets. Imagine pushing those spreadsheets around the organization. When do you get time to value add then? You know, if you're constantly doing spreadsheets, sending it to people and then people working with that and people changing it forever. Oh my God. So thank you for highlighting that. I, I just wasn't aware of that as well. So uh, a brilliant one there. Thank you. Uh, let us ask our audience now about um, technology and, and what to them is the most effective process for unlocking value creation across their organization. Is it culture? Is it consistent and continuous planning, which you've just spoken about, Andreas? Is it using a planning system for XPNA business partnering? Is it breaking down departmental silos? It is, is it uh, using re proper reporting tools? So if you can vote, please. What is the most effective process for unlocking value creation across your organization? Breaking down culture, consistent and continuous planning, using a planning system for XPNA, extended planning and analysis, breaking down those departmental silos, using a reporting tool. Uh, if you can vote, please, I will give it another five seconds. So what is the most effective process for unlocking value creation within your own organization? Uh, culture, consistent and continuous planning, using a planning system for XP&E, uh, business partnering, breaking down departmental silos, uh, and then finally, uh, a reporting tool. I will close this and I will share the result with you. So 33% again went for culture, which is the biggest chunk. 20% continuous and uh, consistent planning, 24% using a planning system, 13% breaking down departmental silos, 11% reporting. Andreas, insight on this from you, please. Um, I completely agree that culture is a very, very important topic. Without the culture, you're not starting the journey into a planning system for an xp &A business partnering. Um, so I, I completely agree with the 33%, but I also completely agree with uh, the other topic that uh, at least 24% uh, have the idea of uh, have using a planning system and not Excel sheets anymore, which is great. Uh, breaking down departmental silos, I think, can be done a little bit more. Um, because that is exact, but I, I combine that together with the planning system for XP and A business partnering. So it's a kind of 37% going into the right uh, direction. Um, so, but, but that is a, an answer which I was expecting. Absolutely. And, and of course, reporting come with using all of those tools anyway. So that 11% should, should completely disappear. Culture is again playing uh, the biggest and the most important role there with continuous planning and planning system. So thank you for the insight there, uh, Andreas. Let me now close this and uh, uh, go back to the question we have from yourself to the other panelists. So panelists, if you can join me again, of course, Andreas talked about technology and what technology can do for us in terms of value creation. So how does technology enhance value creation within your own organization? Can I start with yourself, Mohammed, please? Yeah, thank you, Andres, uh, for the very good presentation. Um, uh, I, I like definitely implementing the right uh, APM and having the right systems. Uh, so uh, um, uh, having the right uh, APM, as mentioned by show, we need some uh, thing to you know monitor our uh, KPIs, monitor our performance, and linking and connecting the dots across all the whole organization. 
So I believe having the right uh, APM is a very important uh, system, along with having a good, you know, tools for data visualizations and uh, prediction and some, you know, uh, use of uh, data analytics. So I believe, uh, yeah, Jedox is one of the great example of this one. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, Shu, you're on, please. Yeah, <clears throat> well, this is more about capacity, right? Because we all have eight hours a day, you know, like uh, 40 hours a week. So if we spend a lot of time, you know, like manipulating the Excel spreadsheet and we're reconciling the data, then we're gonna lose the time that how we can add value and partner with the business to, you know, manage the data. And I think as Mahan mentioned, that a lot of time we really need to spend is to build a trust with the business, right? And building a trust is not like something overnight that we can do, it takes time. It takes, you know, a lot of time for us to understand the business. It takes time to build the trust, build the relationship, build the understanding and build the alignment. But if we spend too much time on doing an Excel, then we lose the time on the other side, which is the critical part of adding value, right? So that's why I feel like the technology can significantly enhance the value creation because it's basically help with the capacity issue. Absolutely, absolutely. And and to your point there, Shu, we, we saw on, on my stat and on Andreas' um, mm -hmm. stat, uh, you know, we're spending 65% of our time just pushing data around and trying to uh, get to a level of information. To your point as well, single source of truth is what we're fighting for. But once we can do all of that, then we can concentrate on the value added stuff. So absolutely spot on there. Uh, Shady, your point of view, please. First of all, thank you, Andreas, for, for your presentation. It, uh, it also uh, touches base with our daily interactions and uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, businesses. Uh, one more, one important point I'd like to highlight uh, where I've experienced the importance in technology and business continuity. Uh, we have the data available. Uh, it's it's not the ownership of one person. It's not an Excel file that one person knows about. It's it's available data for everyone to to uh, to achieve. And I've I've. Throughout my experience, I've I've taken this as a, as an important part. You know, the business continuity, business as usual, regardless of the people. Uh, we've talked about capacity uh, with Muhammad's presentation early on, and this this is exactly you know uh, being more efficient, uh, not wasting time building things all over again, and the amount of rework that happens. Technology is here to eliminate all this. Uh, one last point, if I may, it's about the culture. I'm not surprised to see the culture as the number one barrier probably to, to everyone. Uh, people not letting go easily of those dear Excel files that they've created of, or they've inherited a couple of years back and they've been managing uh, through them all these, all these years. So yes, culture is the number one barrier for, for a huge advancement towards technological uh, well-being. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Shady. Thank you very much, panelists, and Andreas as well for presentation. Just stay on the camera, guys, because we are now going to our uh, fantastic uh, uh, summary conclusion uh, element. Let me just quickly remind the audience, please, guys, keep sending your uh, questions. We've got a lot of questions here, but we will answer some of them today. The rest via email to all of you directly. Um, and please stay for the exciting Q&A that's going to come just after this session. So let, now let's go and quickly look at the key conclusion from each of the panelists. Let's start by Mohammed. Mohammed, a quick conclusion from yourself, please. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Uh, I believe the key conclusion is uh, we have to change our mindset and we have to believe that if p is not a support function or service function, really we are in the heart of the organization. We have to work closely with all functions. We have to leverage all what we have, technology, resources, data. So this is uh, our role. And to uh, to be able to do that, I believe we have to have the right mindset, have the right skill set, have the right technology, culture, as mentioned by uh, Shadi, and also freeing up our time. Yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh... Um, so let us now go to Shu and Shu, what will be your key conclusion for this uh, session? Yeah, my key conclusion is that how we execute, right, the value creation with all the, you know, the five pillars that Mahad mentioned and basically how we take from zero to one 
in how we set up a proper structure, right? From, you know, from nothing, right? To we have something in place. You know, the journey is not, um, sounds very simple, but it's not easy, but I encourage everyone to try in your organization. Uh, you probably need to implement some of the change management and also change mindset across the board. And you probably need to spend some time to set up the culture of the business partnering and the value creation, but it's all worthwhile. And um, on the other side, you know, um, my key conclusion is in order to make it happen very well, we cannot lose the technology piece because of the capacity. And also as a finance, as a responsible organization, we cannot, we need to always look at the long-term sustainability, not looking at only short-term, you know, profitability, right? Like, okay, how much we're going to get this year, but look for long-term. Are we, are we going to successful in the next five years? Are we, you know, sustainable, like being social responsibility for the society? We need to look at something long-term. So that's my big takeaway today. Thank you very much, Shin. Let's go to Shady now. Shady, please. So Hans, uh, for me, it's definitely number one comes as an FN, FNA or finance uh, to lead the agenda. It's in our DNA to manage to manage resources efficiently. As I said, the guardians of the temple have been playing this role ever since. So it's important also for sustainability to be led strongly by the finance uh, organization. As, as I said, keep on continuing chief impact officer enhancing, emphasizing on that point, or chief value officers uh, for, for the future. The second, the second point is, as highlighted, it's responsibility and profitability. The same way there is no profitability without cash collection, I believe that profitability should not continue without responsibility. Uh, the greediness, the, the, the wrong allocation of resources has to stop at one point, and we need to factor in responsibility in our financial KPIs. Someone has to pay the price and someone has to gain for doing the right thing. Fantastic, Shady. Thank you very much. Great points there. Uh, and finally, let's go to Andreas and get his key conclusions there. Andreas, please. Uh, a great management systems which we saw here today. Um, I'm a really firm believer after many years uh, in that area that the automation is bringing exactly what Shu mentioned, also capacity uh, for doing the right things and uh, the, the, the right culture, like Shady said, for um, uh, getting rid of the uh, uh, Excel sheets, inherited Excel sheets, uh, where one or two people know what's going on, but nobody else, nobody else does. So after the automation, uh, the very important topic is the collaboration with, through all the departments. It's not a, um, I would say, gameplay only for the Office of Finance. It's for the whole organization and the whole value chain. Absolutely spot on there. Thank you very much. And and the tool has be has to be for the whole organization and collaboration. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So thank you for your great conclusions there, um, panelists. Uh, let us just stay there and then move on to our next session, which is the Q&A. So let me just quickly remind the audience again, please keep sending your uh, questions. We've got time for a few maybe today, but all of them will be answered to you directly via email to your email. So thank you very much for that. Um, let us go now to our uh, first question, which goes to Mohammed. Um, Mohammed, of course, We've looked at your pillars um, for success and with uh, culture is a big one. Uh, what can we do with management if they don't want or don't support culture change? How can we influence uh, culture? How are you doing it yourself within your organization? Yes, thank you. That's a very good uh, question. I, I believe uh, we have also responsibility as a finance people to rebrand the finance inside the organization. We have to uh, focusing on how to brand fi finance as a value creator. If our business partners see us as a true value creator, definitely they will support us and they will you know, get the buy-in from our uh, ideas. So I believe once people see values from us, I believe de definitely they will support all of our uh, ideas. Absolutely, and, and it's all about business case. Um, you know, making sure people know the benefits of all of the initiatives that you're bringing together. One other thing we don't often do, Mohammed, uh, is celebrate successes. Let the board know, let the people know what what was the success and how much time we've saved in doing this, in doing that, or in stop stopping doing something, etc. So that's another way that you know we need to make sure we share our success with everybody else, with board, with management, in terms of 
you know, how much beneficial whatever project is or has been, isn't it? Under percent hands, believe me, finance need to promote and you know brand for themselves. As as you mentioned, we need to celebrate and show people how much we create value. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Great answer there, uh, uh, Mohammed. Our second question, of course, goes to Shu. Shu, thank you very much for sharing uh, this model um, that you've kindly implemented in a couple of organizations. Can you give us an idea of you know how you go about doing it, how long it takes, and and some of the challenges you 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 face, please. Yeah, well, um, I would say you know this model, the key part is the change management, right? Um, how people are going to accept this model and what it means for them, and what 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 it means for them to how they operate their business. So I think you know you're going to spend a lot of time, you know, to make sure that you build the trust, you make sure understand why behind every actions, and the most critical part is this model is very structured, but I tailor this model into different companies based on different companies' culture. So, uh, so for example, like you know, ICA, we care about employees a lot, right? We don't want to implement suddenly a lot of changes a very strict way. So I do a sec, you know, like a phase one, phase two approach in introduce this model very, you know, granularly. Uh, so make sure that people can follow very well. However, in my last company, it was a very financial driven company. So everything is black and white. So in that kind of different company culture, so you, you basically can introduce the models all together. So if people can well receive, right? Because people want to change. So it depends on different cultures. I would say, you know, in order to make sure that your model works, the most important thing is the people's buy-in and alignment. So please spend more time understanding your people's needs and how this model will address the people's needs and concerns. It will set up the foundation for your success rollout of this model. And of course, you went through all the different steps there in your presentation itself as to you know what you should look out for, how do you do it, what yeah. is the results, and and to me, of course, the, the the monitoring of the whole KPI element was was the you know end piece that has to be a, a part and parcel of it as well. Yeah, so, and I also found that you know it's not something that. Um, it, it makes sense, right? And also the KPIs, you're not going to ask people to redesign your KPIs. It's more like how you organize all the KPIs in your company and have a struck way to manage to manage that, right? So um, I think it's make sure that you introduce this kind of the benefits and why we're doing it to people very clearly so people can get it, right? And then eventually, you know, if it is very hard to implement, I also in my first company, I found very challenging to implement because people are, you know, like, what does it mean to us? I even pilot in one of the two in one function to see how it works and show this as a very good example before rolling out to the whole company so i would say you know the rolling process is very important but it's very flexible depending on the, the company culture and the companies you know the, the the way that how people can digest all the changes so absolutely. good luck with everything so yeah absolutely a good framework from you but of course you've got to think about your own environment your your own uh, people, your own culture, and everything else. So thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Shu. Uh, let us go, now go to Shady. Question for you, Shady, and, and really interesting question, even though it's very, very short. How can we manage competitiveness and sustainability together? Well, it's a, it's a very, very important question. Indeed, as you mentioned, a few words that says a lot uh competitiveness at the end of the day it's sustainability it's not our company alone you know it's it should be the target and the objective of of all companies and all players in the market so this if this happens first of all everyone would be on the same level second i invite everyone to really discuss about sustainability in their uh, in their companies and each in his own field and you'll find out like some, several examples where sustainability is actually cheaper than uh, unsustainable methods. I'll give a small example where I, I, I mentioned in my presentation about distributors who have these huge warehouses and these rooftops are sitting idle, not being utilized. By simply installing solar panels, you're reducing your utilities bill, if not eliminating the, the utilities bill. This is a very small example where it shows that sustainability can pay out. It is actually a better off than a non-sustainable solution. Uh, I don't have enough time to, to, to give more examples, but 
this is the angle where we need to look into things. Uh, yes, uh, one more thing, uh, if I may. Uh, we, I mentioned that we pay a premium to our farmers, but then uh, many consumers actually buy us and are loyal to our brands because of this, because of the fact that we are sustainable. And I think Andreas mentioned that the, the new generation, the millennials in our companies are actually asking for sustainability. And they're not only asking the sustainable policies and plans of the companies they're joining, but they're also demanding the sustainable plans of every each and every con, uh, consumer product they're buying regardless of the price so first of all i tend to disagree on on sustainable being uncompetitive two it is a quite uh, a much needed need uh, becoming a, a, big, a huge need in the in the consumer world that people are demanding for their products to be sustainable absolutely absolutely and, and just just a couple of days ago one of the big supermarket chain in the uk uh, has moved from packaging and are using dispensing units for stuff like pasta uh, you know all the dry goods and and instead you will you will kind of think of oh, how is the take up going to be you know moving away from these things conveniently being packaged you go and pick it up but amazingly, the, 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 the reception of the change they've done, it's just amazing. People want to see more and more of it rather than less and less. And that doesn't mean to say they are not competitive anymore on those products. Absolutely no. People are, want to go there to get these, even though they might be same price or slightly even more expensive. They're happy to pay that. So thank you for that, Shady. Um, our final question uh, for today is, of course, to Andreas. And, and Andreas, you've spoken about technology you've given quite a a broad brush as to how effective it is can you touch on a few instances where it can enhance the capacity and capabilities of fpna for example reduction of time what can we do a predictive analytics except i've got quite a few examples but i'm sure coming from yourself how it helps fpna reduce the amount of time they're spending on non-value add stuff andrea you on mute by the way yeah yeah sorry um yeah so um a, a very um per, uh, example which we have at the moment a, a company we are working for at the moment uh, i talked about the company who has a six week forecasting cycle uh, so it takes them six weeks to collect all the data manually and after introducing a technology now they are down to one day so uh, imagine what kind of time you're freeing up for all the resources in the company taking care about uh, data uh, getting the insight of the data and then making the, the decisions to move into the right direction instead of just collecting manual entering data reconciling it etc uh, that was a, a very very um, drastic i would say reduction in time uh, which we had here yeah no fa fantastic example i always give this example of of microsoft um uh, revenue forecasting in japan where they were taking two to three weeks hundreds of people to forecast their revenue on a monthly basis um and they moved away from that using predictive and prescript prescriptive planning and analytics and that moved from two to three weeks to two to three days involving two to three people so think about how much saving it is and similar to your example andreas there yeah. great saving yeah, and, capacity. yeah and another example is a company who is saving now around two hundred forty thousand dollars a year because he moved to an enterprise performance management system and not doing anything on a manual basis anymore, which is an incredible amount of money uh, from my point of view. Yeah, exactly. So only a few example, I'm afraid, for our session today. So uh, that's all for the Q&A session. Uh, panelists, just stay on the camera. I've just got a few more uh, slides to go through before we close off the session. So ladies and gentlemen, please keep sending your, we've got a minute or two to finish. We will answer the rest of the question via email. Uh, this is for the upcoming calendar for yourself. So June 22nd, maximizing FPNA value through automation. And then finally, the latest trends and development in FPNA, uh, our global surveys coming out on the 12th of July. So please 
book that in your diary and join us for these uh, last couple of uh, uh, events before our summer break. Uh, it is now a great time for me to thank um, Jedox for putting this together. So thank you very much, Jedox, for our panelists, for their great insight, great presentation, and for answering those questions, for taking the time to be with us today as well. And thank you very much to the whole of the audience for taking the time to join us. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have done. Um, this is how you keep in touch, so please do so. Uh, I'm afraid this is going to be uh, the final slide. Just before I close the uh, event, let me just quickly remind you that uh, you will get a pop-up uh, feedback. So tell us how we did, but also tell us what are um, the topics you would like to hear in the next event also. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for um, spending the time with us today. Hope you've had a great time and you've learned lots. And thank you very much. And we hope to see you in the next session. So thank you very much. And it's goodbye from all of us. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.